I'm just going to redo some calculations involving gravimetric analysis. So the first type of calculation we are going to do is for precipitation in gravimetry. So does anybody remember what happens in terms of the procedure when we are doing precipitation gravimetry? Does anybody remember? Any of the steps? Or what is the purpose of it? Alright, so all right, so this is the next. So geometry, like titration, it's a next it's a next quantitative technique. Alright. So for this one, as it says, precipitation, it means that at some point we must get a precipitate being formed. So with this technique, we are going to be check, we are going to determine the concentration of a particular ion, just like with titration. Alright? But this is a different procedure from titration. So one of the scenarios in which we use this form of geometry. One of the scenarios in which we use this form of geometry is to determine the concentration of pollutants in water. So for example, lead ions and chloride ions, especially for kids. Alright? So what would happen? What we would do so if we want to determine the amount of lead ions or chloride ions in a sample of water, once we get the water, we need to get the lead ions out of it somehow, right? so that we can quantify it. So it's not like qualitative analysis, we just want to know if lead is present or if chloride ion is present. It's quantitative analysis. So we need to find the amount, the exact amount. So we're not just trying to find out if lead or chloride is present, but we're trying to find the amount. So what we have to do is convert the lead ions, right, which are aqueous, to a precipitate, right, so to a solid form. So to do that, what we have to do after we collect the water sample. Alright, or if someone provided you with the water sample, right? Then now you would get a small amount, probably 20 mil, right? So you probably pour 20 mil of the sample, right? In a beaker, probably a 250 mil beaker. Now we need to add a next solution now to the beaker, right, or to the water sample that will allow the lead to form a precipitate. So, for example, now this is where you need to remember the solubility rules for the salts. So, we are interested in getting, all right, for this example, we are going to work with lead ions. Let's make with chloride. And so PB2 plus. I want to get PB2 plus as a precipitate. If I add a solution of potassium nitrate to the solution, I will not get a precipitate. Alright? Because the lead ions are going to come down with the nitrate ions to form lead nitrate. Now all nitrates are soluble, so we would not get a precipitate. Okay. 
Looking for the eraser. Right. Likewise, if you have the chloride ion, right, and you add, let's say, a solution of magnesium chloride, not magnesium chloride, magnesium sulfate, the magnesium sulfate, or ammonium sulfate, The chloride ion, if it combines, if you add this solution to it, right? Remember, this is basically a displacement reaction. So the chloride ion would combine with the ammonium ion. So you would have gotten ammonium chloride, which is soluble. Any ammonium salt that you get is soluble. If you use magnesium sulfate, you would get magnesium chloride. All right? So those would not work. So whatever you are adding, you have to ensure that when it combines with your ions of interest, then you will get a precipitate. So if it was the chloride ion, you could add a solution of silver nitrate. Because when you add silver nitrate, the negative ion, which is a chloride ion, will combine with the positive ion, which is the silver ion. So, when you add the solution of silver nitrate, the silver ion will combine with the chloride ion, and you will get your precipitate of silver chloride. Alright? Now, in most questions, they would have already given you the precipitating reagent. So, the precipitating reagent here would have been silver nitrate whatever you add to this sample to get your precipitate so in this case it would be silver nitrate for lead i would use potassium or you could use potassium iodide any metal in group one any metal in group one will give you a salvasol so potassium iodide that is salvo all right However, when you put it in the water, in the sample here, the lead ion will combine with the iodide ion, and you will get a precipitate of lead iodide. Right? So if you were to choose a precipitating reagent, you, you have to know if the ions that you choose, if they will actually form a precipitate. Right? So lead iodide it's insoluble in water, so you will get a precipitate. Likewise, silver chloride. Right? So once you collect the sample and you select the amount you are going to use, then we need to add our precipitating reagent. So since we are doing lead, we are going to continue with lead. Right? If you want to take up anything, let me know. Because I'm going to erase, if not. Can you erase? Take that as yes. So the precipitating reagent in this case is potassium iodide, and we would add it in excess. Because we want it to react with all of our ion of interest, our analyte, in this case, lead ions. So we could probably add, let's say, 100 mil. That is definitely enough. Okay, now let's put 70 mil right, of KI. Right. So, the beta. Alright? 
So we are adding excess. Potassium iodide to the beaker. So the potassium iodide it is your precipitating reagent. When you add it to the beaker, you are going to get a yellow precipitate. That is lead iodide. So that is how we are going to get the lead out of this solution. Now once you have the precipitate being formed, which technique would be used to separate the precipitate from the rest of the mixture? Which technique? If you have a mixture of, if you have a mixture in which you have an insoluble substance and a soluble one, which technique would you use to filter it? Well, just the answer. You have to filter it, so it's filtration. So once you get the precipitate, you have to filter it. So the next step is filtration. And this is gravimetry. So for filtration, we have, we don't use the regular filter funnel or conical glass. Alright, we use what is called a Buckner funnel. Buckner funnel. Buckner funnel. Suction flask. It's also called Buckner flask as well. Alright? Right. I'm using the term suction flask. And a vacuum pump. How much is enough for vacuum pump? So to do the filtration process, you use suction flask, buckler funnel, and vacuum pump. So no conical flask. So once filtration is completed, it means that inside the filter, inside the Buckner funnel, we would have our precipitate. Now we have to purify it. So in most cases, you can use distilled water, but depending on the precipitate, you might use an next solvent. All right? So you would rinse the precipitate. We will rinse the precipitate with distilled water or an appropriate solvent or a next appropriate solvent. Once you rinse the precipitate to get rid of any impurities, then it's time to dry the precipitate and weigh. So the procedure is simple. Precipitation will occur, then filtration, then you weigh the precipitate, well, dry it and weigh. All right? So we finish rinsing it, so we're going to transfer it to a crucible where we, where we will dry it. Once you rinse it, you are going to weigh an empty crucible. <laughs> uh, 
right? After you read the empty crucible, then you are going to transfer the pitch, the precipitate to the empty crucible. The transfer the precipitate to the empty crucible. Then you will drive the precipitate in an oven. And finally, you will weigh the mass with the mass of crucible with the precipitate. There's a crucible plus the crucible down here. Good. So once the crucible is dry, meaning we have gotten rid of all of the water, then we're going to wait again. If you don't weigh the crucible properly, the mass you obtain here is going to be higher than it should be, right? So your results will not be accurate. And for up here, you have to rinse it to get rid of any contaminants. Right. So the key steps, precipitation, filtration, drain, weighing. Those are the four important steps. And so if you are asked, on the exam for any procedure regarding precipitation gallometry, remember the key steps and you put them in, right? And you can fill up the minor parts, such as weighing the crucible and rinsing the precipitate, or wash the precipitate if you want to say that. Alright, so once you would carry the procedure, you would obtain a mass for the crucible and the mass for the crucible would be precipitate and then we and then we would do some calculations. Alright, so we're going to work an example. Is anybody writing at this point? Alright. Let's mm -hmm. say the mass of the empty crucible. Okay. Is twenty five point five eight grams. That's the empty crucible. And let's say the mass of the crucible plus the salt plus the precipitate is 28.14 grams. All right, so those are the two readings we would take our measurements. The empty crucible. Then the crucible with the precipitate after it was heated to get rid of all of the water. So what we are going to get from this now is the mass of our precipitate, the anhydrous form of it, where no water is present. So the mass of precipitate. would be equal to the mass of the empty crucible, sorry, mass of the crucible plus the precipitate 
which would have been 28.14 grams minus the mass of the empty crucible, 25.58. And let me see. So 28.14, take away 25.58. Okay, 2.56 gram as the mass of the precipitate. So that's the mass of our precipitate. Right, right off this and we'll continue. All right, so the mass of our precipitate is 2.56 gram. Remember the precipitating reagent, it was potassium nitrate. Not, not potassium nitrate, potassium iodide. So that as well. What, when they tell you the precipitating reagent, you should know the precipitate that would be produced. So if I add potassium iodide, you should know that the lead ions would combine with the negative ion of the solution that you are using as the precipitating reagent. If it's a negative ion that is the analyte, then it will combine with the positive ion of your precipitating reagent. So if I add potassium iodide, then the lead ions, as I've shown you before, it will combine with the iodide ions of potassium iodide, and you will get the precipitate of lead iodide, PbI2 solid, right? Lead iodine is true. I don't know what 53, 106. Let me check the mass of iodine. I think it's 106, but let me just check it. One twenty six point nine. All right, so the molar mass for our precipitate lead is two hundred and seven, and iodine is one twenty six point nine. Two hundred and thirty-three point nine. Right. So that's the molar mass. The unit is gram per mole. Sir. Yeah. Sir, right. in of times by two, the one twenty-six point nine. Yes. Are that? Yeah, it comes. So it will be 207. Sir, um, can I see the numbers at the top? 
Is it P P B I? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, it's P B I two, and this right here is the state symbol. It's solid. S for solid. Okay. Sir. Yeah. All right. So two hundred and seven plus one hundred and twenty-six point nine times two. So I got four sixty one. All right, thanks. So four sixty one gram per mole. So what's what's times the two? One hundred and twenty six point nine. That's the atomic mass for for iron. Right, so we're going to need two things to start off with. Doesn't matter which order you put it in. All right, we're going to need the balance equation for the precipitation reaction. And we're going to need to calculate the moles of our precipitate. But since we're on the, since we have the balance equation already, the next thing we will have to write is a balance, a mole ratio. So we need a balanced equation. So is this equation balanced? No, sir. Balanced? What is needed? Sir, two iron. Iron, two in front of the iodine. The iodine ion. However, what are we trying to find from this experiment? Or from this scenario, what are we trying to find out? We're trying to find the concentration How of how much lead. Yeah. Right. Good. But we don't know the moles of lead, right? We know the volume of the sample we use. But we don't know the lead. So what we're going to do, we know the mass of the precipitate. So we're going to work out the moles of the precipitate which is lead iodide. And once we get the mole of the precipitate, we're going to use mole ratio to get the mole of the lead ions. So since we have the mass, we know that mole is equal to mass divided by the molar mass. So the mass will not have been two pint how much? What is the mass of the precipitate? All right, 2.56 grams divided by 461 gram per mole. A gram, that cancel gram. Okay, 5.55 times 10 to the minus 3 moles. 5.55 times 10 to the minus 3 moles. Right? So this is the mole of precipitate, which is PBI2. So the question now, if you have the mole of PBI2, right, and you want the mole, so you know the mole of PBI2, and you have the mole, and you want the mole of lead. What are we going to do at this point? You know the mole for PBI2, and you want the mole of PB2 plus. What should we do at this point to get the mole of PB2 plus? Same mole ratio. Right. So even though we have lead ions, iodide ions, and lead iodide, we are not interested in the iodide ions. We know the mole of lead iodide and we want the mole of PB2 plus. So the mole ratio between the lead ion and lead iodide is one to one. So the mole ratio is one to one. 
right between pb2 plus and pb i2 so if the mole ratio is one to one right what is the mole of pb2 plus If the mole ratio is one to one, what's the mole of lead ions present? It's going to be the same thing as the lead iodide, which is 5.55 times 10 to minus 3 moles. Right? So when you're starting off the question, if you want to start with the mole, so you can find the moles of the precipitate, right? Then you go ahead and write your balanced equation and the mole ratio, right? And you use the mole ratio to find the mole of your analyte. So we found the mole of the precipitate, write the balanced equation, then mole ratio, then we use mole ratio to find the mole of the precipitate. Now once you have the mole of the precipitate, because we want to find concentration, all right? So we know that molar concentration is equal to mole divided by volume. What was the volume I used? Twenty? Did I use twenty mil of the water sample in the question or in the procedure? I think it was twenty mil. Let's work with 20 mil. So it will be 5.5 times 10 to the minus 3 moles divided by, remember the volume must be in DMQ. So 20 CMQ would be 0 0.02 DMQ. Right. With 0.278. 0.278. Remember the unit is moles per DMQ. All right, so you can follow five simple steps. Mole of precipitate, balance equation, mole ratio, mole of analyte, and then the concentration. All right, so now I'm going to take a question from this study guide, and you're going to attempt it, and then I will give you a pulse paper to, to, to attempt. So I'm going to give you a question now from this study guide. And then a post paper. Let me know when you're finished taking this off. Finish art. If anybody is writing, let me know. All right, so for this one, it says, where is it?
I'm going to read the question as I read it. In order to determine the chloride ion concentration excess silver nitrate solution was added to 25 mil of the sample. We determine the chloride and concentration in a water sample. So it should have said in order to determine the chloride ion concentration in a water sample, excess silver nitrate solution was added to 25 ml of the water sample. The precipitate, the precipitate form, the precipitate form the precipitate form was filtered, washed, and dried. No filtered wash. Dry and we a mass of one point five two gram was obtained. For the precipitate. So, a mass of 1.52 gram was obtained for the precipitate. Determine the chloride ion concentration. All right, so I'll give you one minute to write. It's off and four minutes to try it. It's now 7.01. About 7.05. We'll go through it. Or you can tell me an answer when you get it.
And what do you finish? Yes. The IMM of silver is 107 or 108? Round off to 108. Okay, in that case, my answer is 4.36 more per centimeter. All right. 4.26? All right, let us see. So we can start off by calculating the mole of the precipitate. Oh no, mole is equal to mass divided by Molar mass. So the first question is, what would be the mass of the precipitate? Not the mass of the precipitate. What is the precipitate that would be formed? Say silver chloride. Silver chloride is correct. So that would be 108 plus 35.5. All right, that would be 143.5. Yes, sir. And the mass of the precipitate is 1.52 gram. So 1.52 gram divided by 143.5 gram. How much I got? So about 0 0.01059. 0 0.01053. 59. Yes, sir. All right. So we have worked out the mole of our precipitate, which is silver chloride. So the next thing we're going to do is write our precipitation equation. So we know that the silver ions would have reacted with the chloride ions to give silver chloride. So what is the mole ratio between silver ions and silver chloride? One to one. One to one, right? So the mole of silver ion is equal to what? If it's one to one, what is the mole of silver ions? Sorry, we should try to find the chloride ions. <laughs> yes. Try to find the mole of the chloride ions. What would be the mole of the chloride ions? 0 0.01059. So after we have the mole of silver of chloride ions, we can go ahead and calculate the molar concentration, which would be equal to 0 0.01059 moles. And what was the volume we given in the question? Um, 25 milliliters, which is 22.5. No, not 2.5. Something wrong. I wrote 2.5, like in my seconds. So 0 0.025, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How much you get again? No, I calculated 2.5 and not 25. Oh. All right, so how much you get with this? So I did run off my moves. So. All right, let me just. So. Sorry, 0 0.4236. All right. And I can run off the moves, so that, that is not a problem. All right, so 0. How much, Jonah? 4236. All right. And the unit is moves per. DMQ. Right. 
So next question. Is anybody right in this? Or finish right? Right, so this is a very old first group of question. So a fair injured milligram. So a 300 milligram solid containing chloride.
And in case you can't see the questions down here too well, the first question, write a balance equation for the reaction. Two, calculate the mass of chloride ions in the sample. And three, calculate the percentage of chloride ion in this sample. For the first one, it said write a balance equation for the reaction between silver nitrate and the chloride containing sample. So it actually said for the reaction between silver nitrate and the chloride containing sample. All right? Yeah, so give your next five minutes to try this. Um, so it said bone to have a mass of what milligrams? 525 milligrams. Okay, thank you. All right.
And will you finish? All right, so first, let's tell me the mole of precipitate. What did you work out the mole of the precipitate, which is silver chloride? Same as silver chloride. All right. And what is the mass of the precipitate? Um, I got 0 0.525. So why do you use 0 0.525? Because it's milligrams and I'm using grams. Right. Because the unit for molar mass is in, gram, is in grams. So you cannot have milligrams and grams. You have to work with the same units. And silver chloride is 143.5. So the mass of the precipitate was 5525 molar mass is that. So what's the number of moles? About 3.66 times 10 to the negative 3. 3.66 times 10 to the minus 3. That's right. All right. And then the equation? Um, I will... AgNO3 aqueous plus Cl minus aqueous makes it is AgCl solid plus NO3 minus aqueous. So it's silver nitrate plus the chloride ions to produce silver chloride plus the nitrate ion. All right. Oh, we already know that the Mole ratio between the chloride ion and silver chloride is one to one. So therefore, the mole of the chloride ion is equal to? 3.66 times 10 to the negative 3. All right. And once we have the mole, well, what did it ask for? The mass. All right. So, mass is equal to? Most Most. All right. So it will be 3.66 times 10 to the minus 3 times its chloride ion, right? So it's 35.5. How much I got? Start about 0.12993 and I round it up to 0 0.13. All right, 0 0.13 grams. So the answer is for what? The percentage, right? Yes, sir. So the percentage, the mass of the compound, in this case, it's an ion, right? So 0 0.13 divided by the mass of this sample, which was 0 0.3 grams times the 100. What is the answer? How much is that for the answer? 43.3%. 43.3? Yes, sir. All right. Good. So good job. So as you can see, the procedure is the same. Calculate the moles of your precipitate, write your precipitate in the equation, use the mole ratio to get the mole of the analyte, in this case the chloride ion, 
once you have the mole, if they wanted concentration, you would have gotten a volume. And at that point, you would have put mole over volume. But they ask for mass, so it's mole times the molar mass of this ion, right? And then percentage is the mass of the compound, or in this case, the ion over the mass of this sample times 100. Right? So I have another one from 2018. Is anybody ready? All right. So this one is from So you're hearing me? Yes, I'm hearing you. Sorry, um, this is what you guys did last week? No, we did cross papers on reactions of benzene and phenols. This is geometric analysis. Okay, sir. Right. So we're just practicing the calculations for geometry.
Alright, so I'm just going to read it in case I can't see any of it properly. A sample of potassium chloride of mass 0 0.450 gram was dissolved in water and treated with excess silver nitrate. A precipitate of silver chloride of mass 0 0.8402 grams was obtained. First question, calculate the number of moles of silver chloride produced. Question two, deduce the number of moles of potassium chloride in the sample. And three, calculate the percentage of potassium chloride in the sample. All right, so four minutes again, and then we we'll work it. Sir? Yes? What's your name? I'm saying no, it like you have like different um equations or equation. ways in which you can find the moles based on what you're given. Come to that. Sir, could you like write the formulas, please? Like I mean for this part. No, sir, you know, like when based on what you're giving in a question, mm -hmm. they have different ways in which you can find the moles. I'm just asking if you can write those different ways for me. Like, for example, they give give you the mass in this, you have a specific way in which you use the mass to find the moles. And if you're not given, you mean if you're not given mass, I yes, just sir. want to work the next way. 
Yes. Right, but this, all right, this question, all right, governmentary, this question, all right, this question, it's come a certain way, all right, so it's going to be worked in a certain manner. So for governmentary, well, after you get the question, right? So what happens in this technique, precipitation in governmentary? They are trying to find the concentration in most cases or the mass of a specific ion. So for example, in this question, right? They tell that a sample of KCL, they give it a mass and tell you that it is dissolved in water and treated with excess potassium, sorry, silver nitrate. So what we normally do, we are we're normally interested in a particular ion. So it does like lead, calcium, chloride, it doesn't matter, right? But that ion is going to be in a sample or like in a water or a part of a compound, right? And you want to know information about that specific ion. So like the percentage of that ion in a compound or the concentration of the ion in a water sample. So what we do now is add a sub, if it's a solid compound, we have to dissolve it. But if it's like it's a water sample, we don't need to dissolve it because it's already dissolved. So what we do is add a solution that will combine with the ion to form a solid. So we get a precipitate. So that precipitate, we have to filter it so we can collect it. We dry it and we wait. So what happens? That precipitate, right? So let's say you have lead ions in water. We add potassium iodide. The lead ions combine with iodide ions. We get a precipitate of lead iodide. We wash, we rinse it to get rid of impurities. We dry it and wait. So the calculations involved now. You see that precipitate that we collect. We're going after we record the mass. We're going to use the mass to get the moles. And we know that mass is moles divided by the molar mass. So once we get the moles, we have to write our balance equation. And the balance equation is to use the mole of the precipitate to get the moles of the ion we are interested in. In this case, it's lead. And then once we get the mole, if it's concentration, we divide it by the volume. If they want the mass, we times it by the molar mass. So for this type of calculations, it's not like a lot of formulas. In terms of moles, we are just dealing with strictly mass. So we always find the mole of the precipitate, write a balance equation, find the mole ratio. Once we get the mole ratio, then we use it to find the moles of what we're interested in. So this calculation is a specific stepwise process. I'm not sure if you understand what I mean. You get it? Sorry, uh, so much. Hmm? All right, probably because I missed the first part. So I'm going to show you with this example, right? As I see, with the example we just did, we calculate the mole of the precipitate then we write a balance equation and we use the mole ratio from the equation to calculate the moles of the chloride ions. And because they ask us for mass, then we go ahead and find mass. In this case, in this example again, they're asking us to find the mass. Because once I say calculate the percentage in this sample, we have to get the mass of the, sum, of the compound. Right. So I'm going to erase this portion and work it. Johnny, oh, wait, excuse me, sir. You should question three make sense. Yeah, when it makes sense. Calculate the percentage of KCL in the KCL sample because the oh. sample is KCL. It's an impure sample. Hold on, let me see if you the word impure. So it's an impure sample. I left out the word impure. So it's an impure sample, a sample of impure potassium chloride. That means something else is there, not just KCL, that is giving the mass of 0.45. Understand? If it's, if it's impure, it, it's not just KCL. 
So the 0 0.54 gram, it's not just KCL because the sample is impure, it's contaminated then. So if it's impure, we want to know exactly how much of the 0.45 gram is actual KCL. Is it any clearer? Not really, but you can move on. <laughs> no, as in, if you have a, what is a sample? Like, if I pour out, remember, these are ionic compounds, right? And if I say it is impure, does it, do you only have KCL present if it's impure? No, sir. No, sir, and I understand what you're saying. I just don't know how to answer three. Oh, no, man. You actually know how to answer it, man. It does no one with. All right, when we get there, you will see better know how to do it. All right, so this is precipitation gravimetry. So the steps are always the same, all right? In this one, they said a precipitate of silver chloride of mass. So you're always going to get the mass of the precipitate, right? So this is what I'm saying. We have a standard, a set standard of course, four calculations, basically. You will get the mass of the precipitate. So we are going to calculate the moles of the precipitate. So that's the first calculation we do. They will give you the mass for your precipitate, and we're going to calculate the moles of it. So to get the mole, it's simple divide the mass by the molar mass. We're asking if we can use a di different formula here. Yes, sir, we just want to know, like, normally you have different formulas that you use to find a mole in a question, but I wanted it for the specific one. But All right, so one more. You want to use... Like direct relation, all right. Not sure if I mean like this. So the precipitate is silver chloride. So we know that one mole of silver chloride, it weighs 143.5 grams, right? So we would want to know how many moles would be in 0 0.8402 gram. Is this what I mean? Sir, that's like the ratio method. No, not more ratio. No, because you say you want to do a different way. But, hold on. So, all right. You mean, all right, in this question, we are given mass. So, you mean like if a next question, you are given concentration and volume, you want to know how to use concentration and volume. To find, find. That's what I'm oh. Right. Oh, so, yeah. So that is what, right. So I was clarifying, right? For this question, this is precipitation gravimetry. And so what you will get is the mass of the precipitate. So you, you won't be getting that concentration. It's not like in titration, we have concentration and volume, and you would multiply the two of them to get the moles. For gravimetry, you will get the mass of the precipitate and you have to find the moles of it. So oh, yeah. Right. Okay. Yes. So you won't be getting other stuff relating to the mole. It's just the mass. All right. And at the end, right. So every once it's precipitation and geometry, this is how the question sets up. You will have a sample, right? The sample will have a mass. Or if it's a liquid sample, like water, you would have gotten a volume. So if it's a liquid sample, you will find the concentration. But if it's a solid sample, you will be asked to calculate the percentage. All right? At the end, you will get the mass for the precipitate. And the first thing you are going to do is calculate the mole of it. So you are given mass. So mole is mass over molar mass. So it's 0 0.8402 grams divided by silver chloride the molar mass is 143.5 
drum for a moon. Joanna, a better answer? Um, sir, about 5.86 times 10 to the negative 3. Sorry, 5.8? 8, 6 times 10 to the negative 3. Mm -hmm. Oh, sir, book 3, would we use the HACL to find the KCL and then that, that's what you would do? Yes, that's what we would do. Okay, okay. Yeah. So tell me the equation I wrote. Sir, HENO3 aqueous plus KCL aqueous reacts to give HECL solid plus KNO3 aqueous. Right. So silver nitrates. So as in the question, a sample of potassium chloride was dissolved in water and treated with excess silver nitrate. That means the reaction is taking place between a solution of KCL and excess silver nitrate. So that is what will be on the reactant side. Potassium chloride and silver nitrate. So remember, we must get a precipitate, right? So if you have silver nitrate and potassium chloride, this is a double displacement reaction. There's a big term, not much. Just know that the positive ions from both from both salts will replace each other. So you get potassium nitrate and silver chloride. So potassium chloride and no silver chloride and potassium nitrate. So German is correct. All right. Silver chloride is a precipitate, which means it's a solid. That's why the state symbol for silver chloride is solid. All right. Now remember the question is asking us for the percentage of potassium chloride in that sample. That means for Joanna, what is the formula for percentage? How do we get percentage? Um, sir, the mass of the thing you divided by the mass of the sample times 100. All right. So that means we are trying to find our objective, our main objective is to get the mass of potassium chloride. But in order for us to get the mass of it, what do we need? How do we find mass? Share with the moles. Moles times. Amen. Right. Did the question ask you to find the mass? No. Exactly. However, even though I did not ask you to find the mass, did you find it? Yes, sir. Hmm? Yes, sir. Right. So from a finding, why have a problem? The question. All right, let's see what your problem was. All right. So here, the question is asking us to find the percentage of KCL in the sample. So we need to get the actual mass of KCL and divide it by the 0 0.45 gram and times it by 100. And we said that the, the formula for mass, the formula for mass is mole times molar mass. So let's look at the equation. Is it balanced? Yes, sir. All right. And we are interested in which two substances? Sir, KCL and HCL. Right. Because we know the mole of AGCL and we want to find the mole of KCL. So since the mole ratio is one to one, the mole of KCL is the same as the mole of the precipitate, which is silver chloride. So the mole of KCL, so I try to find the mass of KCL. So it's mole times molar mass. It's one to one mole ratio. So the mole of KCL, of the same as this. So it is 5.86 times 10 to the minus 3. What is the molar mass of KCL? 
Zero point so this is the mass now of pure potassium chloride. So zero point four four gram. That's the mass of potassium chloride that is present in the impure sample. So point four four the divided by point four five times a hundred. How much I get? Ninety seven point eight. All right. So that's the percentage of potassium chloride in the impure sample. Do we have any question? Um, sir, could two ways to reduce the number of moles of KCl in the sample? We were supposed to, sir, when it said for question two, when it said reduce the number of moles of KCl in the sample, we are supposed right. to use 0 0.44 as the max, right? No, 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 no. no. We use the 0 0.45. Hold well, on. Um, if it says deduce the moles of KCl in the sample, remember again, the sample is impure. That is the key part. If the sample is impure, it's not just KCl. So when they ask for the mole of KCl in the sample, you have to use the mole ratio. So this is the mole of KCL in this sample. The 5.86. All right, so the mole of KCL in this sample, just like when you say one-to-one -one mole ratio, so the mole of KCL, mole of KCL is equal to 5.86 times 10 to the minus three. This is the mole of KCL in this sample. You cannot use the 0.45 the point four five is impure. So it's this amount of mole of KCL that is in the impure sample. You understand? Yes or no? They can tell me. Oh, yes, sir. But when I did it, the 0 0.44 divided by the 74.5, I got 5.91 times 10 to the negative 3. When I did what? Um, When I used the uh, Mass of KCL to be. 0.45 over this? No, the 0.44 over the 74.5. I got 5.91 times 10 to the negative 3. I'm wondering if it's because I rounded it up to 0 0.44, but the one from before the area was not rounded up. No, well, then. if you put the 0.44 here, right? This is must, don't. Yes, sir. So you put this over the molar mass in order to get moles? Yes, sir. But remember, you would already, in order to get the mass, you would already know the moles. No, question two came before this. Right, so the first so the question, no, I'm showing that, all right. Is that okay. what you saying? So the first question calculated the number of moles of silver chloride, which we did. Then it asked us to deduce the number of moles of KCL present. And I'm saying once you use the mole ratio here, one to one mole ratio, so the mole of KCL is equal to the mole of silver chloride. That is the mole of chloride in this sample. Uh, you were just double checking the answer. So if you put this over this, you should get about this here. That is what you were saying? Yes, sir. But so, I didn't get it back. Oh, so you were double checking, right? You should get it back. So you put 0.44. For, how much you get back? Tell me. I got 5.91 times 10 to the 3. So I'm wondering That's if it's enough. because I rounded off. Probably. It's close enough, though. Because basically, 5. Both of them are basically 5.9 times 10 to the minus 3. Right. Okay, thank you. Right. 
Sir, so what you suggest, we leave it as it is, or like for example, we get an answer, we leave it as it is, or we round off. All right, for most, no one, when you're working with these numbers, you tend to get a lot of decimal places, so you can work with three decimal places. However, it depends on how many zeros are in the decimal place. So for example, if you get an, an answer like, 0 0.000462, just put it in standard form. So I wouldn't advise to write 0 0.0005, right? The more zeros you have, you need to use as much, as much significant figures. So but when you have a letter of zeros, that's when you go to a standard form here. So we can use of these actual numbers right so it would be 4.62 times 10 to the minus 1 to the minus 4 but if you have an answer like 0 0.01374 we can just say 0 0.014 all right so it just depends on how many zeros are in the comes after the decimal point but generally Three decimal places are good when you're rounding off. So you don't need to write out all the digits after the decimal place. Okay. Three is good. No more than four is needed. All right. But if you get a lot of zeros, work with standard form. Understand? Mm -hmm. All right. So just to recap again, right? If you notice in this calculation, we calculate mole of the precipitate first, then we write our balance equation, and we use the mole ratio to get our analyte, the mole of our analyte, which, which is the substance we are interested in. We are interested in KCL, we are always going to have the mole of the precipitate, all right? So in the question, you will get the mass of your precipitate, so you calculate the moles of it. Then you write the equation. You will have the analyte that you will need to find the moles for. You will already have the moles of your precipitate. That is why we use mole ratio between the precipitate and the analyte. Once you get the moles of your analyte, in this question, they skip the digital purpose. They did not ask you to calculate the mass. They went straight ahead and asked you to find percentage. What well, percentage is the mass of your analyte here, mass of the compound over mass of the sample. So if you know that you must have the mass of the compound, they don't need to tell you to find the mass of it. You are supposed to know that once they ask for the percentage, they have to work out the mass. So once you get the mole, you times it by the molar mass and you will get the mass. Then you go ahead now and put it over the sample, which is just like the question we were before with the 200 gram sample, the 200 milligram, right? So once it's a solid sample, they will ask you for the percentage. But if it's an ion that is in water, they will give you a volume. Once you get to this point, we will find the mole, you will just put it over the volume and you have your answer. All right. So we can go to a question with the volume, please. With the volume? Mm -hmm. All right. Let me just do that one quickly. Because we did that, that, that one earlier. All right. Um, by the way, this is being recorded, so you can watch back afterwards and see the questions. All right, I'm just going to put the information, right, because I want to do the next other type of gravimetry. So let's say I have a water sample. So let's say I have 30 mils of a water sample, and they are interested in finding out the concentration of lead ions. 
in it. So you want to find the concentration of lead ions. So in this procedure, what we would do is add a precipitated reagent. For example, we can use potassium chloride as well. All right. So we would add potassium chloride in excess. Good. When we add potassium chloride in excess to the 30 mils of the water sample, we are going to get a precipitate. All right. So we add the potassium chloride in excess, and then we are going to get a precipitate of lead chloride, PbCl2. All right. No, this precipitate will be in the, let's say it is, it is in a beaker, right? This precipitate will be a part of the mixture. So we need to filter it so we can collect it. So we filter it, wash, dry it, and weigh it, all right? So the precipitate of lead chloride, we will have to weigh it. So let's say we get the precipitate now as a mass, Precipitate as a mass of mm, 3.5 grams, 3.52 grams, all right? It doesn't matter how long the question is, this is what it is centered around. You have a volume of a water sample, you want to know the concentration of lead ions. To do that, you have to add a solution that will allow the lead to be converted to a precipitate. So we add the solution in excess. In this case, we are using KCL solution. The lead ions will combine with the chloride ions to give you the precipitate of lead chloride. The reason why you get a precipitate, lead chloride is an insoluble salt. So chlorides tend to be soluble, but lead chloride is not soluble, just like silver chloride. That is why we could use potassium chloride. Potassium chloride is soluble, so it dissolves in water. Once you get it precipitate, we have to dry it and weigh it. So the question will give you the mass for the precipitate. All right? So that's it. We now need to find the concentration. So you notice I gave you the volume of the, of the water sample. I gave you the mass of the precipitate. I told you what was added to the solution. All right? The KCL was added to the solution, right? And you found the precipitate of lead chloride. I gave you the mass of the precipitate, 3.52. And, and your objective or your job is to find the concentration of lead ion. So let, let me just see if you understand the first step. So what would be the first step or what should be the first step in our calculation? For this type of calculation, what do we always do first? All right. We're always going to calculate the mole of our precipitate. All right. I always calculate the moles of our precipitate. And the mole is mass over molar mass. I'm joining up. What was the mass? Check the mass for the chloride for me. 208 plus 71. All right, so molar precipitate is mass divided by molar mass. And so it will be 3.52 grams. How much? 279. All right, 279 grams per mole. So 3.52 divided by 279. How much I get? 0 0.0126. 0.0126? Yeah. All right, mold. So once it's precipitation gravimetry, the first thing we're going to calculate is the mold of our precipitate. 
this that is the chloride, that is the mass of it. So you just work out the molar mass of your precipitate and put the mass over it. So we get the moles. The second step is to write a balanced equation. Have you written out this, the information already? Renisha? So what you said, sir? I was asking if you wrote out the information here. Yes, sir, I did. All right. So once we calculate the mode of the precipitate, we are going to write a balanced equation. So remember now, the potassium chloride that you added, right? You don't have to write the full molecular equation. You can just write the ionic equation. So the lead ions, unless they are two. So the lead ions, will combine with the chloride ions to give you a precipitate of lead chloride, PbCl2, right? So you can do an ionic equation, just the ions that are needed to form the precipitate. Our equation is balanced. So we calculate moles of precipitate, then we write the equation. Once you do that, we're going to write the mole ratio between the precipitate and the analyte, which is the ion or the compound we're interested in. We're interested in the lead ion. So the mole ratio between the analyte, what we're interested in, and the precipitate is one to one. So we know the mole of the precipitate is the same as this. So the mole of lead ions, Pb2 plus, is equal to 0 0.0126 moles. Mm -hmm. So the first step, we calculate the mole, then we write our equation, then we work with the, use the mole ratio from the equation, we get the mole of our analyte, all right? So once you have the mole now, if there are for percentage of lead in a sample, if it was a solid sample, this is where now you would multiply mole by the molar mass to get the mass of lead ions in the sample. Then you would divide it by whatever mass was given. But in this case, they are asking for the molar concentration. So once you get the mole, we know that molar concentration is equal to mole over volume. So the final step now, the molar concentration is equal to mole divided by volume, which will be 0 0.0126 mole divided by z 30 cmq in dnq is 0 0.03 dnq mm -hmm. i'll get 0 0.42 All right. So one right. second, yeah, go ahead. PMQ to DMQ. Right. So the unit for molar concentration is mole is mole per DMQ. So you must convert the CMQ to DMQ. I remember one DMQ is one thousand CMQ. So to convert from CMQ to DMQ, we divide by one thousand. All right, so that is where we end up with point zero three DMQ here. All right. So these are the steps for the precipitation gravimetry question. All right, so this is what you will do. All right, so we have a next type of gravimetry. 
time is going, so we'll probably we'll work some more of that one next week. But I'm just going to go through the calculations. All right, have we you have finished taking out this? Let me know if you finish. Yes, sir, I am. Just to um, clarify, you're saying um, when they ask for molar concentration, the answer should be in mode for the MQ? That is correct. All right. Sir. And they tend to give you the volume in CMQ, so you will have to convert it to DMQ. All right, sir. Yeah. Now, when you look at, you probably come across certain chemicals written, like a purpose like copper sulfate, written like the CuSO4.5H2O, or like MgSO4.7H2O. And it's a certain compounds, they have a certain number of moles of water in them. All right, so governmentry, uh, this is the next type of governmentry. I'm just going to work two questions, and then next week we go through a little more. All right, but the main objective of this is right, you are going to get the salt, and you will have to calculate. You won't get a number, you will get a letter, whether n or x. All right. And you will need to find the value of it. Right? When the salt has water present in it, that is called an hydrated salt. Right? So when the water is present, it is hydrated. When the water is absent, so just CuSO4, that salt is anhydrous. <coughs> So when you see the term hydrated, it means water is present. In the question, if you see anhydrous, it means water is absent. So with this technique, right, all we're going to do is get a sample of the salt and wait. You get a sample of the hydrated salt and wait. Then you are going to heat it, right, until all the water is removed. So you can eat it. Let's say I heat the salt for 15 minutes, the required mass, right? You can assume that it is dry after 15 minutes, but if you want to be accurate, you would heat it for probably 10 minutes and record the mass again. When the, if the mass is not changing after two eatings, then you know all of the water is removed. So you just reheat until the mass of the salt is constant. All right, so let's just do a calculation. So in the lab, you will get an empty crucible and weigh it. All right, you will get an empty crucible. So again, let's say the mass of empty crucible is 24.50 grams. Let's say you take up a spatula of full of the salt, right? So just take a spatula full and place it in the crucible. So now it's the empty crucible with the hydrated salt. So hydrated copper sulfate, right? So the spatula full of copper sulfate that you add to the crucible, the, the mass of it, it goes up to, let's say 20, what was so far? Let's say go equal to 27.12 gram. Right? Then now we are going to heat this hydrated salt. So you place it on a hot plate or over a bunch of flame and you heat it until it is completely dry, meaning dry hydrated dominant wet. Alright? So yeah. So when we say dry. For copper sulfate, you can just look at the color and know when the water is present, it is blue. When all the water is gone, it is white. 
All right. So again, now once the water is removed, you are going to weigh the crucible again. So you turn off the flame, allow it to cool, and you measure. So this time it is the crucible plus the anhydrous salt. So remember, anhydrous means the water has been removed. So let's say the anhydrous salt is 25.72 grams. All right? That is the lab. And we do this as experiment in Cape as well. So the empty crucible is 24.5 grams. The empty crucible with the hydrated salt is 27.12 grams. And then the empty crucible with the anhydrous salt, right, is 25.72 grams. So the calculation we are going to do now. Remember, the mass of the empty crucible is in both of these masses. So to get the mass of the hydrated copper sulfate, so the mass of the hydrated, I'm just going to put HYD for short, the mass of the hydrated copper sulfate would be the mass of the crucible plus the hydrated copper sulfate, which is 27.12 minus the empty crucible, which is 24.50. Two point six two. That's two point six two grams. And then we're going to do the same thing for the anhydrous copper sulfate. So it is anhydrous copper sulfate plus the empty crucible. That is 25.72 minus 24.50. That is 1.22. And then the next calculation we are going to do now is to calculate the mass of the water that was lost. So remember, hydrated salt has in water. The anhydrous one doesn't have in any. So to get the mass of water that was lost, it's the hydrated minus the anhydrous. So mass of water lost is the hydrated copper sulfate minus the anhydrous copper sulfate and that would be 2.62 minus 1.24 Get 1.4. Right. So the calculation is not finished. I will have done with this information. So the key information we need here is the mass of the anhydrous copper sulfate and the mass of water. So all of this was to get the mass. So this is what we want mass of anhydrous copper sulfate and the mass of water loss. Those are the only two information that we need. All right, so once I finish writing up this, let me know and we go to the other part of the calculation.
Sure, I'm pleased, but I'm not sure if who I am. Is anybody else writing? All right. All right, so once you get the mass of the anhydrous copper sulfate and water loss, I'm going to do this CuSO4 and you put water over here. Alright, you are going to calculate the mole of the anhydrous copper sulfate and the mole of water. So remember, mole is mole is equal to mass over molar mass. So for the anhydrous copper sulfate, it's one twenty two. In copper sulfate, is one six. See, let me just calculate it again. Alright, so six to four, six to four. 32, 168. All right. So it's 1.22 divided by 160. We okay. get 0 0.0076. And then for the water Sorry, load. 2.22 minus 1.60. Is it me? So I'm not for under copper sulfate. It's 1.22 divided by 160. Oh, 1.22 divided by 160. 160 is the what the molar mass of Oh, yeah, yeah. It's the molar mass of copper sulfate. Okay, so. Right. so we are calculating the mole here. All right, so mole is mass over molar mass, which is 160. And it says 1.22 divided by 160. And then for water, it's 1.4 divided by 18. Zero point zero seven eight. Mm -hmm. since we're working at four, zero point zero seven seven eight. All right. So if you take the mole of your anhydrous salt and the mole of water, the mole of water is always going to be bigger than the mole of the anhydrous salt. So once you take the mole of each. It's kind of like empirical formula where we're going to divide both moles by the smaller number. So we'll divide by 0 0.0076. All All right, and we get 10.23. So we just run it up to 10. All right. So we get 10 moles of water. And we know this will go on. All right. And that is it. So the formula now. So the question would have been to find, all right, so let me write it. So you would have the Cu SO4 dot NH2O or XH2O and you have to find the value of N. Alright? So you get once you get 10, that's the value for the water. N is 10. So if you see uh, So it would be CU S O four dot CU S O four dot ten 
page 12. Mm -hmm. So that would be the formula of this other. So in the question, if they will give a mass of crucible, mass of crucible with the dehydrated salt and the anhydrous salt. Not dehydrated, hydrated and anhydrous salt. You just do the calculation, get the mass of the hydrated salt, mass of the anhydrous salt. And you use those two to get the mass of water. Then you put the mass of the anhydrous salt and the mass of water over the molar mass of each compound. You get the moles, when you get the moles, you will divide by the smallest number. The mass of water, the mole of water is always going to be bigger than the hydrated salt, the anhydrous salt. Right? So the salt should, you should always be getting one here and a bigger number over here. Right? And so that is how this form of gravimetry will look. All right. I'm going to send you some questions and you can practice them and I will come back on Saturday and work them. All right. And we'll probably do maspec or back titration. No, maspec. So we do some more calculation on this and we do mass spectrometry as well. All right. So I'm going to end it here for tonight.